What I have here is just a tube with air in it. And it's an open tube. There's an opening here and an opening here. Uh, and uh, what we can actually do is we can create standing sound waves in this tube. Now, the way that we can do that, oh, and, and by the way, this is a, a toy that's sometimes sold under the name uh, Whirly or Twirly or something. I think there are different kinds that you can get. Uh, but, uh, but I just love these things. So we just have a tube of air. What I'm going to do is I'm going to spin it around. What that does, when I spin it, it forces the air in one end and then to come out the other end because there, there's no force to keep the air going around in a circle. There's no centripetal force. So the air will just move out of the end, drawing more in, air into the other end. These ridges cause vibrations in the air, but only certain wavelengths of vibration, certain frequencies, will create standing waves, as we've seen here. Only certain frequencies will create standing waves. Any other waves don't uh, um, uh, uh, interfere constructively. They, there would be so many of them, they just all kind of cancel each other out. They interfere destructively. What I want us to notice then is what frequencies do we actually get? What standing waves do we actually get? We don't get a continuum of frequencies. We only get certain discrete frequencies. And that's what I want you to, to, to listen for. So if I do this very slowly, we don't hear anything. But if I speed it up, it starts making a tone. Now as I go faster, that tone's frequency is not going to smoothly change. It's going to jump from one frequency to another. We can see that only certain frequencies will create the standing waves, certain frequencies that correspond to certain wavelengths that are determined by the length of the tube, and only those will uh, add together constructively to create the, the tones that we can hear. So one more time. So very slowly. Okay, great. Uh, so far, we have just been looking at what happens when waves with the same wavelength combine. Remember, we started out with the two waves coming together with the same wavelength, and then we saw we had points that were uh, uh, interfered constructively, points that interfered destructively. What if we have waves uh, with, with different wavelengths, maybe slightly different wavelengths? Let's take a look at what happens in that case. Let's imagine that we have two traveling waves but with different wavelengths. So here's one that I've drawn with a wavelength of about 20 centimeters, and here's one that I've drawn with a wavelength of about 16 centimeters. Now, we notice that over at this end, we have both of them having a maximum pretty much together. So these two maxima will add together and give us something but much larger. But then, as we move along, notice that, uh oh here, we've got a minimum hitting a maximum, these are going to combine destructively. So we go from a very large oscillation to basically no oscillation. And then we notice again, oh, here we're pretty much back in what we would say is in phase. Out of phase, in phase. In other words, uh, maximum and minimum are out of phase. Maximum and maximum are in phase. So we go back to having a big oscillation. And then you can see that again, we eventually end up with being out of phase. So it goes from in phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase. So what kind of result are we going to get from that? Well, over here, if we were to add these together, what do we end up with? Well, here we end up with a big oscillation. But then it gets smaller, smaller, to here. And then it starts getting bigger again. And then it gets smaller. And then bigger. Whoop, that wasn't very good. Something like that. So we end up with lots of oscillation, 
no oscillation, or very little oscillation. Lots of oscillation, no oscillation. Big amplitude, small amplitude. Big amplitude, small. Big amplitude, small. Something like that. If this were a sound wave, this would be a loud sound. And then very little sound, loud sound, little sound, loud sound. It would, it would uh, be a sound that got louder and then softer, louder and softer, louder and softer. This is what we call beats. This phenomenon we refer to as beats. Now, it doesn't have to be just a sound wave. It could be any kind of wave where they are slightly out of phase. Maybe you've noticed sometime uh, if you're driving along and you notice two cars maybe with blinkers on. Sometimes those blinkers might be together, but if they have slightly different periods, they end up being out of phase, and then if they, you keep going, you'll watch, and then you'll notice that eventually they're back in phase, and then you wait a little bit longer, and they'll be out of phase. So they, that's kind of making like a beat kind of uh, result, where things go in phase, out of phase, in phase, out of phase. Well, let's, let's actually take a, take a listen to something like this. I've got two oscillators that are slightly off uh, frequency. We'll see what they sound like. Here I've got two tuning forks, and if I strike one of them, whoops, you can hear that steady tone. If I strike this one, it gets softer. You can hear it eventually get softer, but it's a it's a steady tone. But if I hit both of them, they sound similar in frequency, but if I hit both of them, do you hear that variation? That, whoops. That's the fact that, that, that's due to the fact that these are not quite the same frequency. They are a little bit off, and so you can hear that, that um, increase or decrease in volume, and that's the beats, though that's being formed by the interaction between the two waves. Constructively and destructively interfering. Okay, very good. Let's try another example of, of these beats. Here I've got uh, an oscillator, like I had in the, in the previous lecture, and I've got this set at 500 hertz. So I'll turn this up. Okay, and you can hear a very steady tone. And another one, also set at 500 hertz. That's creating a steady tone. And if we have both of them going, it's creating a very steady tone. But now I'm going to turn one of them to, turn those off, I'm going to turn one of them to 499 hertz. Okay? This one's now 499 hertz. You might not even be able to tell the difference, but now I'll turn the other one on. You might be able to hear that fluctuation. About once every second. I'll come back to that. I'll turn this down to 499, the fluctuation is faster. It's 497, okay, very good, let's turn those off. It turns out, you can, you can um, demonstrate this mathematically, I won't go through the derivation, but the frequency of the beats, 
the frequency of the beats is equal to the difference in the two frequencies that you're combining. So it'll be the, the larger frequency minus the smaller frequency, or we could just say it's the absolute value of the difference of the two, and that tells us how, how often the beats are um, when the two combine. There's just one more thing I want to mention that, that I kind of sloughed over before. Just let me put one more thing up. When we started talking about waves on the chain or something like that, I mentioned that the amount of tension that is applied will affect the velocity of the waves in the medium. So let's say that we've got some, some medium, like a chain for, or a or a string or something like that for this type of uh, oscillation, let's say that we've got some tension T in the uh, medium, in the, in the chain or the string or whatever. Also, I said that the, the uh, amount of mass that we're trying to move will also affect the velocity of the, of the waves. Let's say that for some length of the, of the, of the string, there's some mass of that length we'll define what's called the linear mass density. And different textbooks will use different symbols for this. Um, the, uh, the free online textbook that we're using at the moment uses the symbol mu. So this is a lowercase Greek letter mu. A capital mu looks like a capital M. Uh, and this, it, it's written like a U, but with a little uh, line, a tail in the front. So just write the tail and then a U like that. That's mu, like we've seen with uh, micrometer and things like that. So uh, mu is the linear mass density, which is the mass of a section of the, of the chain or whatever per length. So the units of this will be kilograms per meter. It tells us how much mass the object has per unit length, per meter. It then turns out that the velocity of the wave is equal to the tension, the tension in the wave, divided by the linear mass density. So we can see the bigger the tension, the, the, uh, the more you pull on it, the faster the velocity, the greater the mass, the slower the velocity, but then it's the square root of that. Okay, so there we go. So uh, the velocity of the waves are equal to the root of the tension divided by the linear mass density. Okay, very, very good. Next time, we're going to switch to a completely different area, and I know this was a kind of a short lecture, um, but next time, we're going to switch to a whole new area. For our last two lectures, we're going to very quickly go over a very broad section of physics. I wish we had more time, but uh, we only got two more lectures to go. We're going to look at thermodynamics. One thing we have not been looking at is how does the temperature of something or how does heat added to something affect its properties? Well, we'll start that next time.